70 year old treaty right that has powerful symbolism for Cherokee Nation in the country, but also the potential for such great substantive uh, work for the Cherokee Nation, because having more champions on Capitol Hill is something we need, something all of Indian country needs. And so if you can take the person that has built up this government relations team and put her in the House of Representatives, the House of Representatives is not going to know what hit them when she gets seated. And she will get seated. We're working on that. Um, but I feel fortunate every day to work with her. I think uh, this opportunity for you to interact with her, uh, listen to some highlights, ask some questions, is something I, I, I wish for every citizen. And I'm glad you all get the opportunity to do this. So I'm going to step away. I'll listen in uh, until my next meeting. But I'm truly appreciative of her and, uh, and appreciative of, of this effort to reach out to their at-large community. So without further ado, our delegate to Congress, Kim Teehee. Thank you, Chief Hoskin. I appreciate the kind words. Um, so hello, everyone. I, I think the first thing we're going to do is Adam is going to uh, open up the screen so we can see everybody. Um, uh, I kind of like to see the faces that I'm talking to whenever I'm giving a presentation. Um, and, uh, um, and feel free to um, I think everybody's listed as Donnie Squirrel, so feel free to um, uh, turn your video um, on so that we can um, see you. And uh, so, as you know, uh, we have Cherokee citizens all across the United States and even across the globe. In fact, our most recent numbers that we have is, you know, we have uh, 380, more than 388,000 citizens, citizens in every state and abroad. And our largest um, at-large community of Cherokee citizens is in California. And they have a, a citizenship population of over 23,000. Texas uh, closely follows that um, with more than 20,000. Uh, in total, we have about 245,000 citizens who live off the reservation at Cherokee Nation. So that's a pretty significant number. And so civic engagement has um, a priority of uh, Chief Hoskins and um, in a priority of mine. And so we are um, excited to have you be engaged and to uh, speak with us today. Uh, and we just want you to know that no matter where you live, uh, your voice is important to us. Um, so what I wanna do today is tell you a little bit about government relations um, before we kind of get into the other pieces so you'll so you can appreciate what what we do and how we play a role in the civic engagement piece and and ultimately what ends up being how you can support those efforts um adam do you want to start with the slide yes i'm just going to quickly go over uh some of these some of these things so that you can see what government relations does um we typically sometimes have with people who are new at Cherokee Nation or Cherokee Nation businesses, or when we have um, employment, uh, employee uh, retreats, we sometimes give presentations just to remind folks about what we do and what some of our, some of our um, hot button issues of the year were. And so this um, is something that we have created and it's, a, it's an ever evolving document that's updated uh, annually. We're actually in the, process of updating it now, but I wanted to go ahead and, and share it with you since we've got you um, on board. Um, government relations job is to work with Cherokee Nation's administration. We are in the chief's office um, and, um, and we also work with Cherokee Nation businesses and our job is to work with leadership of both the businesses and the nation uh, to ascertain what our priorities are and to assist in developing and executing the strategies in order to accomplish things before the Congress, the state legislature and elsewhere. Adam, we, there you go. And, um, but, in, but in addition to that, we have staff that, um, that uh, <laughs> I lost, okay, there you go. Awesome, there you go, that, perfect. <laughs> in addition to that, we have uh, special projects that, um, uh, my staff work on and we handle some special events for the chief and 
um, and we and, and for the employees as well. And so we also handle all um, appointments um, for the chief, uh, whether it's nominations to federal, state boards and commissions are uh, within the tribe itself. Um, chief Hoskin believes that in order for us to be the most effective is that we have to have a voice um, in every aspect of government. And so um, we have partners in all the states where we are, in all the states, you know, in all the states, right, we have influence there. We've engaged with leadership in California, um, just like we do in Oklahoma. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I am fortunate to serve on the Greater Tulsa Indian Affairs Commission, but there are several other commissions that other people serve on. But the idea is to make sure that we're in a place and in a position to advance our interests and to educate about who we are as well. Um, we also manage a pretty robust um, uh, voter registration product. We just saw in this presidential election um, highlighted, especially in Arizona, the significance of the, Cherokee, of, the, of the Native American vote. And we do have Cherokee citizens in Arizona um, in, in that state. Um, but there are other states like Michigan that have a pretty significant Native American population. So I'm just so glad that nationally, um, Native Vote has really taken hold. And so we call our project Cherokee Vote. Um, our staff also, whenever we renew um, in-person at-large meetings, we attend the at-large meetings. We have voter registration desks there and, um, and we support uh, uh, those events as well. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's kind of uh, what, we, what government relations do as well. Adam, you wanna go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to, so I talked about state activities. Let's go ahead and go to federal activities. Adam oversees the state portfolio, but I just kind of wanted to go through some of what, what we do. Um, so I handle all the federal um, issues. That's my specialty. Um, and I uh, work with Adam on the state um, efforts too, but he leads that effort. Um, and I don't want to toot our own, own horn here, but I do want you all to know how proactive the government relations is at Cherokee Nation. We do have a 100% record. Um, every legislative bill that we've wanted to get through the state legislature and in Congress, we've been able to do. Every regulatory change that we've been wanting to do, we've, we've to get accomplished, we've been able to accomplish. And we've also been influential in um, uh, working with the attorney, our attorney general's office in litigation, always with an eye toward if we have a negative federal court ruling, then it's possible that we might need to go to Congress and have Congress respond legislatively. And so an example, current example of that is the Affordable Care Act. We hear about the Affordable Care Act being on the chopping block and it possibly being considered unconstitutional. And you may ask yourself, why does this matter to me, right? Well, the, um, the single most important law, federal law, that authorizes Indian health care delivery systems is called the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. And that law was placed in the Affordable Care Act for permanent authorization. And so if the Affordable Care Act gets declared unconstitutional in, in total, and then we will have to quickly pivot to Congress to give the permanent authorization again that we've enjoyed for so many years. And so that's an example of of how we work on the judicial piece of things and just laying the foundation um, and such. Um, Adam, do you wanna move on? And then I'll go into some other more current issues. Some of the special events that I talked about that we oversee, we host um, legislative day at the state capitol here. Um, we typically host Cherokee days um, at the, um, Museum, uh, National Museum of the American Indian in DC. Obviously COVID has altered the in-person kinds of things that we are able to do. We host youth summits, elder summits. We have employee appreciation awards. We feel it's very important to acknowledge our citizens and our employees um, throughout the year. And so uh, we host several events throughout the year and we've had to change the format to virtual settings, which gives rise to why we're meeting today. Adam, you wanna do the next slide? We also run uh, the Cherokee Vote Program, which I talked about earlier. And it's you know been around for, I think now about seven years. 
And since its inception, we've registered over 13,000 voters. We don't just register for tribal elections. Every time we go to an at-large uh, community, whichever state we're in, we also are trying to register you for your state elections too, and, um, and for federal elections as well. And so by, to do this, we attend multiple events throughout the year. And if your communities are interested in us helping you gather that information from your states and to also have the forms that you can easily deliver to, your, to the citizens in your states and your communities, then we're happy to set you up with that material as well. Um, and we um, will be launching a uh, website soon called On Cherokee Vote. But this is just a snapshot of of, uh, of kind of what government relations does. And these are, are my staff. Um, we have staff on the, on the businesses side and as well as on the nation side. And Adam and I spend um, a majority of our time these days in Tahlequah, and which is where we're at today. Um, and so, but I want to, but we're excited about this next thing. We're very excited about this because over the years, we have, you know, kind of had these one-off letter, we get citizens who write in and ask us, you know, um, tell me more about this issue and how can I help? Or when Chief Hoskin is speaking about delegate to Congress, for example, we really got a lot of citizens asking, how can we help? How can we um, uh, get our member of Congress engaged? And so this is really where Chief Hoskin started thinking about um, us being more organized about how we interact with you um, in a way that gives you up to the moment kind of information about the issues that are pertaining to us. So we do have um, a web page that we've launched recently. Um, it's called, um, well, it's a microsite on the Cherokee.org um, uh, website. And it's on the tab called About the Nation. And I'm gonna ask Adam if he can put that in the chat. Um, and you click on um, Citizen Action. And what you will see in Citizen Action is, um, there it is. So what you will see there is, are some template letters that you are free to customize um, on your own. Adam, actually, could you put that screen back up? Because I want to talk about that just a second. And- yes, uh, Actually, yeah, there we go. Okay. And hey. so, um, <laughs> <laughs> Just... The um, that's okay. So the citizen, so the citizen action page shares with you um, uh, certain letters. They are listed there, and there's a brief, like one line sentence of what they are. Um, for example, uh, we talked to Chief Hoskin talked about delegate to Congress. Well, there is a template letter there that um, you can write and send to your member of Congress. Um, and how this is helpful to us is we had great momentum uh, from last fall and early spring of this year on Delegate to Congress, and we did not have a single member of Congress raising any of So what we've created here are template letters that we hope are going to be easy to use for everyone, um, where you'll put your name and information at the top. Um, the date, obviously, who you're addressing it to. We also have member your where you can look up your member of Congress or the Senate, and then you know write specifically to that representative, and then it provides a nice script here. Uh, so this is the one about the CRF funds. Obviously, right now Kim is talking about delegate to Congress, so I will go ahead and pull that one up, and I think we have her connected Thank again. Thank you. All right, and everybody, I apologize. Um, I had someone who kept trying to call me, and when I tried to just turn them off, I end up cutting myself off the entire call, so I apologize. But I'm using volume on my cell phone. Um, so delegate to Congress. Uh, we had early momentum um, in last fall and spring of this year. March was our last meeting in D.C., um, and we had wonderful meetings with our delegation with leadership, with Speaker Pelosi, and she was so excited and thought this was uh, re refreshing. And you know, and she said, you know, I can see the delegate, um, and she can through House rules. Um, but guess what happened? We got a worldwide pandemic going on, and so I, everyone's priorities, nationally, internationally, shifted toward dealing with um, COVID relief. 
and so and so did our priorities. Um, we know that Congress um, missed out on and omitted tribes from mention in the first two COVID packages that Congress um, enacted. And so I worked very closely with uh, the National Congress of American Indians and my former colleagues and the lawyer lobbyist teams in DC. And we we're, we worked night and day to make sure that Indian country was included in the third COVID package that Congress enacted. And we were in the CARES Act. Um, and so the problem with the CARES Act funding, though, is that it requires us to spend down our dollars by the end of this year. And um, even though we're um, in a second wave of spikes um, right now. But in addition to that, um, the agreed upon language, and these were, these were literally, I just want you to appreciate how important these issues are and what your role could be here um, as well, is I'm texting at midnight my time, 1 a.m. DC time with Congresswoman Deb Holland of New Mexico. Why? Because she was the one having direct conversations with Speaker Pelosi about Indians being included in the CARES Act funding, about Indian country being included. And I had gotten word in late night negotiations that the White House was trying to not be so friendly um, with that. So, um, so uh, um, anyway, ultimately, uh, we needed uh, Speaker Pelosi to intervene, and she did, and we were able to uh, work with uh, members on both sides of the aisle to get Native Americans included, and I think it was ultimately over an $8 billion fund to Indian country, um, but it still has some issues. The issues are, one, it expires on December 30th of this year. Two, um, ultimately, uh, the Treasury Department has drafted and put out guidelines after guidelines um, that have restricted on the use of those funds. And, um, and that's been problematic as well. And they have very onerous reporting requirements. So the very people who are tasked with spending down the dollars, creating the government budget for the tribal nations are also trying to do these onerous reporting requirements to treasury. And so, um, uh, and so, that's, so herein lies the issue with the letter. So the letter is to Congress because we're, they're talking about a fourth uh, stimulus package. Um, there's, you know, there's been impasses leading up to the election. So this is a post-election um, issue, obviously. And so, um, but still these discussions are kind of lurking back there and Indian country wants an extension. Um, and, uh, and, and we've asked for 2021 or 22, but we just need an extension of time to spend down the dollars. And, uh, and so, that's what that's what we're asking for. And so what we're asking for from you is um, your legislators matter here because this is a nationwide issue. Um, and so uh, and it's relevant um, to both chambers um, to do that. Um, and so that's what that one's for. Um, Indian Child Welfare Act, you know, you may know that we are um, included in the litigation um, right now, federal litigation that has challenged the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And so um, we, um, uh, we are hoping that the federal courts rule soon, but here's the issue if they don't. It's much like what I talked about with the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Indian Child Welfare Act um, just celebrated its 42nd anniversary. Um, it was signed in, when it was since it's been signed into law, and it has withstood uh, court challenges previously, declaring it unconstitutional. Why do people want to declare it unconstitutional? Well, some people have uh, take issue with the fact that there are preferences in the federal law that give preferences to the Indian family, um, so that the Indian child has more connection to their culture and and such, and and so. Um, but it, this has proven to be a, an invaluable and important uh, federal law geared toward enhancing and protecting Native children and making sure they are connected to their un unique cultural uh, communities and tribes. So uh, the reason that this matters is we are doing a lot of stuff right now with working with the National Indian Child Welfare Association and national and and such, and working with our various departments on these issues, but we try to highlight the success of ICWA throughout the year. 
you know, even Congress, the House passed, I think, a resolution uh, supporting uh, Indian Child Welfare Act. And having letters, just these, these reminders of how important this law is, here's the purpose it serves. If for some reason the federal court rules that Indian Child Welfare Act is somehow all or in part unconstitutional, again, like with the Affordable Care Act, we will pivot to Congress to ask them to um, permanently authorize this law again. And um, because, you know, Congress can overturn the court rulings by changing the law. And so um, by, having, um, by having members of Congress hear from their constituents about how important these laws are um, is something that they can look to as constituent requests, constituent support for these kinds of um, laws that impact uh, us. Adam, you wanna to go to the next issue? Treasury disbursement. This goes back to CARES Act funding. So we talked about earlier um, the CARES Act funding. Um, shortly after the CARES, the Indian country received its CARES Act funds, uh, the Department of the Interior and the Treasury Department determined that Alaska Native corporations were eligible recipients of the CARES Act CRF funds, even though the law clearly states that um, that Indian tribes, tribal governments, are the eligible entities for these um, awards. And so um, tribes sued and, that, and, uh, and recently prevailed uh, in the court ruling, but the Alaska Native Federation, uh, corporations have appealed that decision. So um, what that means is there, is there is 534 million set aside for Alaska Native corporations pending the outcome of final litigation. In the meantime, you know, I mentioned that Congress has put a deadline on the date by which tribes must use these funds. And the law does not account for funds set aside for entities that are pending in litigation. It's use or lose. There's no carryover here. And so if the final, if there are final court decisions coming up um, in the next few weeks, tribes are gonna be very challenged if we prevail to spend down additional dollars. Um, so, um, so we had asked for uh, the treasury to just distribute those dollars. Uh, it's, it's sitting there. We had a, we had a, we had a court ruling um, uh, recently. And so that's kind of where that issue lies. Um, Adam, next one, please. Violence Against Women Act. This is something that is near and dear to my heart also, Chief Hoskin and the First Lady, uh, her, whose platform includes protecting women and children and families. Um, but I was instrumental in the um, provision in the VAWA to 2013 Reauthorization Act that um, allowed for tribes to have a limited juris criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit that violent offenses, domestic violence offenses against women on tribal lands, because for years they've gone uh, unapprehended and were able to leave because of jurisdictional gap issues. Um, but that law, VAWA, which um, President-elect Biden is the original sponsor of, has not been reauthorized. And so bits and pieces of it are getting passed in laws that Deb Holland, Representative Deb, Deb Holland has sponsored. And she was able to pull some much needed provisions out of BAWA and also the murdered and missing indigenous uh, space and, and create a couple of uh, bills because of that. And she was able to get those passed in the laws. But BAWA itself has not been reauthorized. And that is something that's very important. There have been sticking points in the Senate over BAWA because um, there are a couple of senators that have take an issue with the jurisdictional languages in there that give uh, Indians some limited jurisdiction over non-Indians. And so that's been unfortunate, but still there was wide broad support and acknowledgement that it's a much needed and it's been a much help. It's been a very helpful law. And by the way, since the authorization in 2013, which is what, seven years ago, and the tribes that have taken advantage of VAWA are many. And there's not in of the non-Indians that have been pro been prosecuted in tribal court, the non-Indians that prosecuted in tribal court, none at this point have ever challenged the authority of the tribe to prosecute them. So this is still not an issue that's been litigated yet. And so, um, and I think that that speaks to the 
great crafting efforts of the lawyers um, in the original 2013 law who anticipated um, the need to put certain checks and balances in there so it could withstand any challenge if there was any. But those are some of the issues that we have up right now. Uh, Chief Hoskin uh, has made it our priority to um, uh, renew our efforts on delegate to Congress. Uh, it became a post-election issue because of COVID. Um, and just because it was the, the priorities of the country were still remain COVID and then election. Um, but you know, now we're looking at the composition of the House. Uh, and just so you're aware too, um, we believe only the House um, uh, needs to seat the delegate. This does not require congressional action. This is the distinction between my delegate position and U.S. territory delegates. U.S. territory delegates require an act of Congress because Congress is required, both chambers are, are necessary in order to seat a delegate in, in the Congress. My position is unlike that because um, as Chief Hoskin mentioned, um, my delegate position is authorized in, in an existing treaty, an 1835 treaty that was already ratified by the Senate and signed in the law. So it is the supreme law of the land. So therefore, only the House needs to act, even though it's 185 years later. The fact is, it's never been abrogated um, by courts or Congress. It's still good law today. And even just in 2017, we had a federal court ruling that um, raised the 1866 treaty, which is an important treaty here. I could give you a whole lecture on the delegate to Congress, by the way, and I, I probably shouldn't. But, <laughs> the, but we actually rely on four documents on delegate to Congress. And I don't know if you guys read it, four documents. It's not just the 1835 treaty. That's the most significant because that's the clearest directive uh, to Congress to seat a delegate in the House of Representatives. But we also have a 1785 treaty that spoke to a deputy. It wasn't as clear. The 1835 treaty was the most clear. We have the 1866 treaty. This treaty is our last treaty with the United States. And it's, the, and it's important because it ratified all prior treaties um, and its provisions that were not in, that were not inconsistent with the 1866 treaty, and that includes delegate. The reason the 1866 treaty is important to us is because it reaffirmed all the prior treaties. But in 2017, the 1866 treaty, our 1866 treaty, was at issue, and on an unrelated matter. But the court told the Cherokee Nation in its court ruling, Cherokee Nation, you must comply with the promises you made in the treaty. And that gave Chief Hoskin, when he was then Secretary of State, the idea, if Cherokee Nation must comply with the promises it made under the 1866 treaty, so should the United States, right? And so, and that's when he got the idea to appoint a delegate to Congress. Now, something else he may not have talked about either, and what you all may not know is, in the 1999 Cherokee Nation Constitutional Convention, uh, Chief Hoskin was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. I don't know if you guys knew that. And he was there when they were discussing a provision that is in our constitution today that requires the principal chief to appoint a delegate and for the council to confirm the delegate, and that's me. Now that is also different from delegates that are in Congress today as non-voting delegates. And that's because I'm appointed and they're elected. The and the and that and the distinction is I'm appointed by the Cherokee Nation's elected leaders. And in 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 that regard, it is akin to U.S. ambassadors, right? You have a president of the United States who appoints the U.S. ambassador. Um, the Senate confirms, and that person represents the United States interests before the government. To me, that's what my delegate position is. I'm appointed by the elected leaders of the Cherokee Nation to represent their interests, the governmental interests of the nation before Congress, before the House of Representatives. And that's also a distinction that is different from the U.S. territory delegates. So I always say, you know, while um, we're, we, we are okay with a non-voting delegate position, mostly because that's where we are going to get the critical support we need to get this passed, but also because it will not offend the Constitution. Uh, you know, we, we, we have had questions about dual representation. Well, you already have a member of Congress. Why do you get to have two? That's dual representation. That's unconstitutional. Well, no. If it's a non-voting member, 
it's not dual representation because what distinguishes a voting member from a non-voting delegate in Congress is the fact that members of Congress get to vote on final action on the House floor. That's it. A delegate does not. But what can a delegate do? The delegate can introduce legislation. They can uh, be assigned to committees. They can chair committees. They can pass amendments. They can speak on the House floor, but they just can't vote on final action. So there's plenty of authorities there and influence there. Um, but that, but that is the distinction between um, member and delegates, um, and the reason why um, having a non-voting delegate in my case would um, be uh, not unconstitutional. And uh, and so we also get questions about floodgates. Well, if you do it, everybody's going to come out of the woodwork. All the other tribes are going to want to do it. Mm, no, no. There's two other treaties. The Delaware Nation of 1778 has a treaty right but it's vague. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, but it's not as clear as ours. The 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, Rabbit Creek is a treaty that applies to Choctaws and Chickasaws. So they have the treaty right too. And, um, but it's also not as clear as ours. Ours unequivocally states, you know, Cherokee Nation shall be entitled to a delegate in the U.S. House of Representatives whenever Congress shall make provision for the same, period. It's unequivocal. And so, um, and so that's kind of where, where we are there. And, and that's the big push. So that's the thing that would help us the most is if you saw that letter and you're welcome to customize it, to add what your own, we just offer language for your consideration um, and to urge your members of Congress uh, to take action and to support delegate to Congress. Because if we get seated um, uh, in the upcoming Congress, it, it's the fastest, most non-controversial way would be through a House rule. And the House votes on rules every legislative year and they from time to time may take up a new rule. But that could entail seating. Um, I do think we have more support um, in the majority in the House than the minority. But at the same time, we uh, recognize that we have uh, a congressional delegation that is now again 100% um, of the minority party um, in the House, but we've worked so closely with our delegation that we've had to um, answer questions and get um, legal analysis for some of the questions that they've raised in order to allay their concerns. And so what we said to leadership before COVID is, you know, we want a cooperative aspect to um, pursuing delegate to Congress so that our delegation doesn't feel like this is just being ran down their throat. You know, you'll notice, and we watched very closely how this happened, that the House swiftly passed legislation that would give the District of Columbia statehood. And that's awesome because Eleanor Holmes Norton, the delegate from D.C., um, is rising in leadership. And she's an interesting story because um, she is the highest ranking delegate that the United States Congress has ever had. It is possible one day if she's reelected, she could be Speaker of the House with no voting power <laughs> on the final on final passage on the, on the in the House chamber. That would be funny, right? But but you start kind of hypothesizing about how that plays out when it comes to delegates. But at the end of the day, that was a partisan move, and it and the House knew that it was not going to see the light of day in the Senate. And as a result, um, it's going to be very tough to get bipartisan support for something that was used as political football. Uh, we didn't want that to happen with the delegate issue. We could have gone and done something similar. And, but I'd rather go in knowing that um, our delegation especially didn't feel like we were ramming something down the throat, that we were willing to answer the questions that they had, because right now they don't oppose. They, they just had questions because they've been asked so many questions themselves. But no one opposes, and everybody sees this as a house issue, and um, and and so I'm hoping that we can get momentum with that again. And and by the way, we are preparing a letter to the Biden uh, Harris transition team and urging uh, Vice President Biden elect and, and Harris elect to uh, support the delegation letter. So it would be pretty easy to convert that letter, and we can probably put one up on the screen once uh, the chief finalizes the letter that he's going to send, and we can put a template on there to. To the to the transition team, but we're gonna we're we're working on that again. Um, by the way, um, I think Harris, uh, Vice President-elect Harris, 
and almost all of the de Democratic presidential candidates supported um, through Twitter um, delegate to Congress when this was announced, include, and, and so including leadership, including Pelosi. It's just, so we're pulling all that back up again and just reminding stuff because the gap that we've had from March to now because of COVID, um, when we were already having to spend a lot of our time educating people about this position and our treaties and such and getting and, and getting the support we need, we're, we're kind of having to reinvent the wheel again because a lot of time has passed since then and a lot of people have had to do a lot of stuff um, to make sure this country is back on track with deploying resources out because of COVID and, and because of the election. And so anyway, um, but speaking of the election, so I, I'm, I don't want to run short on time here, but I do want to maybe talk about just a few things because, you know, we're all waiting to see if um, we have a president that's going to be a holdover tenant um, <laughs> come January. We don't know what that's going to bring. Um, and so we're watching that play out, right? Um, but what you may not know is now we have, um, as a result of the elections, um, you know, I, I'm excited about this because when I worked in Congress one day, um, many years ago when I worked in Congress, um, I was there at a time when there was a period where we had no Native Americans on the House side. Um, and uh, in the next legislative year, the House of Representatives will have five Native Americans and one Native Hawaiian. Um, and that's exciting. And um, so the five are Congressman Tom Cole, who's Chickasaw Nation. He is the Republican uh, co-chair of the Congressional Native American Caucus. Um, Representative Deb Holland from New Mexico. She's Laguna Pueblo. Um, she was reelected. We have Mark Wayne Mullen, um, uh, who's a Cherokee citizen. Um, he was reelected as well. And you have, um, Cherise Davis, who is from Kansas, who is a citizen of the Ho-Chunk Nation in Wisconsin. Um, and you have, and I cannot pronounce this last name, Kahalo, Ka um, Kahalo, something like that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm butchering his last name. But he is, uh, from, um, he is from Hawaii, and he is Native Hawaiian himself, so he's indigenous. And so that's pretty exciting. And it would be an exciting time for um, the House. It would be historic to have um, a house that's probably the most diverse that it's ever been in this country's history, and to have um, uh, to have the United States through um, the Speaker honor a treaty, the symbol it would give to Indian Country about the United States honoring its promises, however old those promises are, they are still valid. And so, um, anyway, but. Uh, but these are just some of the issues that are going on, and these are some of the issues that are affecting you day to day. And um, it's and we'll continue to populate the um, the letters. I already saw one that we need to update, and uh, and we'll it continue to add more things to it too. But we want to kick it off with some of these letters because um, that's what we get requested um, uh, to have more of um, for citizens to to use them. And I'm happy to take any questions. I, I, I'm, I'm taking your time. I apologize. I know Adam uh, might have some some uh, updates on the state side of things. And we had a question in the chat about delegate and whether we will have a fact sheet or one pager about delegate to distribute as well. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I love one pager. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes. In fact, let me pull from the materials that we have. I think we actually have a one pager um, that we we prepared because we have some lengthy documents just because um, uh, just because um, uh, so much of this discussion we have to start back as to answer the question why now, you know why now gets asked why because most of us don't learn about tribes and U.S. policy in schools unless you specialize in it unless you proactively take an interest in it and read about it. So when you have to talk to somebody who knows nothing about your background, your history, your culture, your tribe, or its relationship to the United States, you have to go back to the 19th century, remove all the negative policies and court rulings that ensued to say, we have just now rebuilt the nation. And it wasn't until the 2000s that our own chief had the authority to appoint a delegate. Um, and so we are now in our footing. Um, and as you know, we kind of retreated because of COVID because we had to make sure your needs, our citizen needs were met. Um, with our with our last efforts in Congress, but 
I appreciate that letter. So yes, we can pull up a, a one pager and those suggestions are very helpful. Uh, whatever we can do to be more user friendly, we're happy to, to try to help. There's also some desire in the chat to do a delegate specific uh, lecture from you at some point to at large. On it. So. I love it. <laughs> I right. love it. I, I, as you can tell, I talk about it quite a bit. I have a 20 minute presentation all the way to a 45 minute presentation to, you know, and uh, um, it just, and I've, I've taught law, I've lectured the law school classes as they, federal Indian law classes as, as they talked about some of the uh, Marshall Trilogy court cases. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. And as you can tell, I'm windy too. So, <laughs> um, and I thought I saw a question, somebody asking how much CARES Act funding we got. Um, did I see that? Because we got great. over 300, we got over 300 million. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but it was over 300 million. That's all public record. And I don't know how much is the 534 million that we would get, but honestly, our treasurer is just, because of all the treasury restrictions on that money she, and the deadline to spend down, she's like, oh no, more, more money to spend down and all those restrictions. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. We have about five right. minutes left. Did anyone else want to okay. ask a question not via chat? Um, there was one more saying, when we submit letters, should we CC uh, Cherokee Nation on the letters? We would love that. We would actually love that. And you know what? That is an awesome point. And we're going to um, update the microsite because we should leave that instruction and we probably should leave um, the contact on where to send the letter so that government relations gets the letter um, too. And we'll keep tabs on that because I, I would like to, honestly, I would like to, you know, we're just starting this, but eventually I would like to be able to um, keep, keep track, keep track of civic engagement and how successful these efforts have been. And I'm sure it's going to only increase over time and over time we'll figure out new ways to have uh, more participation, um, but I'd like to see uh, what works and what doesn't work and modify along the way. Yes, ma'am. So um, first of all, I just wanna say congratulations. This is an amazing presentation. My name is Cynthia Ruiz and I'm on the council in Los Angeles. So my question, I love the letters. Now, would it be helpful at all, especially with the delegate, because I think that issue is so important, would it be helpful to, for me to go to like the city of Los Angeles city council and get a support letter, uh, other native uh, organizations here in Los Angeles to support? To Absolutely. Really okay. Absolutely. In fact, um, and I apologize because I think everybody but me and Adam are pretty much listed as Donnie Squirrel, so I didn't get your name. But if you wouldn't mind in the chat, <laughs> Um, putting your name down, your contact information, because, um, you know, we have such a large population in um, California, and we have a resolution um, on delegate to Congress, and I don't know if we put it in, this, the, in the microsite or not, but we should put the resolutions that we have from the different organizations. The California Indian Gaming Association um, passed a resolution supporting my delegate position. And I don't know if you know um, the Pachanga chairman and his wife, Mark Macaro and Holly, they're very dear friends of mine. And um, they actually spearheaded that effort um, in California. And so that would be helpful. And so helpful because that that is a direct tie to Speaker Pelosi, right? That's the constituent request. So I would love that very much. And we can, we can um, help coordinate that if you need um, a, a different template. Well, we so appreciate um, you taking the time today, and um, and I appreciate Kevin Stretch and Donnie Squirrel for um, uh, putting this together and finding ways in which we can continue to engage with our at-large communities um, during this time. I suspect even when um, COVID is over with and we're all safe to do in-person gatherings again, that will probably do, do some kind of combination of the both because I think um, our citizens probably want to hear from us more intermittently, right? And so I think we've all learned how to use Zoom and these kinds of formats during this time period. And so um, we absolutely appreciate uh, you all being involved. And I know that uh, um, you're, you are an important part of the Cherokee Nation. And I know Chief Hoskin absolutely appreciates all of your participation and, uh, and such. Thank you all so much.
enjoy the rest of your day. Be safe out there, everybody. I know it's everybody's choice to make, but at here, we, we are strong proponents. If you're out of the office, you're wearing a mask. <laughs> Wash your hands. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.